Okay, take them glasses now. Glasses. Oh, glasses now? Yep. Okay. That was one of the final moments before totality was over, when the sun just peeked out from behind the moon during the total eclipse. And this was the stage known as the diamond ring for obvious reasons. Except this year, the edge of that diamond also had a couple large prominences, giant bits of plasma extending out from the sun's surface that you can only see during a total eclipse. And I wasn't even gonna make this video, but earlier that day I met Destin from Smarter Every Day. And he told me, make the videos you love. And in case you couldn't tell from the photo I took in 2017 behind me, I loved the eclipse. It was breathtaking back then, and even more this year. It's also great to make this video because it's sponsored by Squarespace, since that'll help with some of the cost of the trip, but more on them later. But why love the eclipse? Well, this story starts back in 2017. I didn't know what to expect, but I did want to try taking some pictures back then. And I wound up with this picture. And an unforgettable brief moment in awe of nature, standing there with my wife and young kids. We shared totality, when the moon completely covers up the sun, and you see the corona and its prominences. Well, it's not even that. Totality is like a whole body experience. All five of your senses get wrapped up, and a lot of people describe it as a spiritual experience. So much so that Eclipse chasers travel all over the world to taste a little more of that sweet totality experience. But for me, I started planning for this eclipse right after 2017. I saw that a hotel I'd stayed at before in Fruitland, Missouri was almost dead center in the line of totality, and better yet, they're only an hour and a half away. I called them every year between 2017 and now, and finally they'd let me book a room last year. Leading up to our trip, we were getting nervous. The Weather Prediction Center kept changing its cloud forecast, and Fruitland was right on the edge of the predicted cloud cover. Probably the number one enemy of any eclipse chaser is cloud coverage. But before we left, I took one quick test video at home and was happy to see a couple sunspots. One of the biggest things I learned in 2017 is how crazy the physics are on the sun, that big orange ball that sustains all life as we know it on Earth. It's basically a giant nuclear furnace, more powerful than you could ever imagine. And those sunspots? They're bigger than Earth, and even though they're colder than the rest of the sun's surface, they're still thousands of degrees Celsius. But we headed down to Fruitland, and after we grabbed dinner, my wife and I took in one last sunset before Eclipse Day. It was also a good chance to get to test out our Eclipse glasses. And since it's rare I'm out of the city, I also went out at night with my dad after all the kids were asleep, and I took some video of the night sky. It's cool to be able to see the constellations. So few of us get to see the night sky nowadays with light pollution everywhere. Just like the eclipse, it's a natural thing that really connects us back to how small and humble we truly are in all of existence. The night sky was a lot clearer than the cloud cover earlier in the day, so we were hopeful it'd stay that way. And we were lucky, the morning sky was looking a little clearer, so we headed down for breakfast. And in line, I saw this guy, Destin, from Smarter Every Day. And he was talking to Dr. Gordon Telepin, one of the friendliest eclipse chasers I've ever met. And Dustin told me another bit of advice. I'm paraphrasing here, but he said he loves to find people who love what they do and share those stories. And I remember that really came through in his video where he interviewed Dr. Telepin, and it's crazy, Dr. Telepin also shot me an email after I made my Eclipse photography video and offered me a copy of his book, No Strings Attached. He loves to share what he's learned, and I love his enthusiasm. I also bought his app in 2017, I realized, and used it as a guide for both Eclipses, so thanks for that. But they were heading out to set up, and after a quick breakfast, I was too. While my kids were playing some Bluey on Grandpa's Switch, I started setting up my cameras. I wanted to have one tripod with a time-lapse camera and my main camera with a zoom lens, and then a second tripod with my GoPro recording us and our reaction to the whole thing. But while I was setting up, I also heard Dr. Telepin had set up all his experiments, so I grabbed my kids and headed down that way. And look at that, just like in Dustin's video. My youngest daughter liked the bumblebee plushie the most, though it was kind of an easy choice since I don't think she'd care as much about the Purkinje effect, even if she could pronounce it. My dad and I were attracted more to the radio antenna that he had set up out in the field. He was testing signal propagation during the eclipse to see if there were any similar effects to how AM radio signals can travel a lot further at night. I'm not sure yet how that experiment went, but maybe my dad and I can talk about it more sometime on Gearling Engineering. Go subscribe there. But while Dr. Telepin and Destin were setting up all their stuff, my wife and I had our own experiments to work on. We made this fancy pinhole camera to look at the sun, but it does pale a bit in comparison to the sunspotter the doctor brought. 
And we got a lot of use out of the paper plates we brought. At one point, my wife whipped out a cheese grater, and we got to see a bunch of mini eclipses. And later, I put my fingers up, and we observed how shadows got a little weird during the partial stages. My dad also brought his drone, and even though we didn't send it up during totality, I was glad he and my mom could come with us and play with the kids away from our normal routines. Getting to share the eclipse with Nana and Grandpa is something I hope my kids will cherish forever. As I get older, I realize the value of time, especially the value of using it wisely. And I'm not a perfect dad, far from it, but I try, and I hope every dad out there can have a role model as good as my dad to learn from. But I'm kind of getting all sentimental now. A total eclipse kind of does that, I guess, but it wasn't here yet. The clouds were looking pretty good, so I did one last test on my camera rig before we had lunch. And just for reference, the final setup was my Sony a6600 with a 70 to 350 millimeter lens, a Celestron filter that I could quickly pop on and off, and that was all mounted up on my tripod. I originally made a screw-on filter, but someone in the comments on my other videos suggested the pop-off filter, and that was a lot easier to use in the moment, so thanks. I also had my GoPro Hero 7 clamped on the leg with an external battery pack, running a time lapse for the whole day, and another GoPro on my travel tripod recording us. I really wanted to capture my family's reaction, and I know I'd forget if I didn't have this extra camera going. But I won't show you that angle because my wife and I are keeping our kids off social media until they're older. They can decide for themselves when they're ready for this crazy online world. But I went for one last trip around the hotel, and I found Destin had an old Hasselblad set up. I bet he'll be posting some amazing photos after he gets that film developed. But he and I were just a couple of the thousands of people in our tiny corner of Missouri. Everywhere I looked, there were people dotting the landscape. The roads were filling up as more people poured in off the highways, but really, everyone was pretty relaxed, and there was plenty of room to stretch out, at least around our spot. But it was time. At first contact, the moon just starts to nibble at the corner of the sun. Forgive the camera shake, it was a little windy, but you can see it just barely coming into the bottom left here. Over the next almost hour, the moon kept eating away more, and more, and more. Eventually, it even ate up the sunspot. Dr. Telepin's app also mentioned it's a good time to make some observations using all of our senses. As the sun started turning into just a sliver, it was getting darker. The dogs someone else brought along were getting restless, and it was definitely getting colder. And of course, Dr. Telepin had a whole experiment to measure just that. We noticed at one point the parking lot lights came on, and I don't know if it was just chance, but it seemed like the wind even died down. Everyone, even Mother Nature, seemed to be holding their breath right up to the point with the tiniest sliver of the sun remaining. And I'm just going to let this next part happen live. I want you to feel some of what it was like being in that crowd in Fruitland, Missouri on April 8, 2024. Okay, Yes, take them off. How dark it is. looks like a It looks like night. It does actually There's there's the plane up there. Look at the plane. No, the sun is not I mean the, the earth is spinning. But you can see that dot on the bottom, that's a solar flare. Does anybody have the binoculars? When totality began, I popped the solar filter off my camera. That's why it went from black to the whole corona being visible. And here, I'm turning up the f-stop to underexpose a bit. I did that so you can see these prominences more clearly. These are giant filaments of magnetic plasma, like hundreds of times bigger than Earth. The physics of this stuff is mind-blowing, and unless you're NASA, this is really the only time you'll see these things. I snapped a bunch of pictures, like this one shows the corona in its vivid bluish color, and this other photo shows that prominence in its more fiery red color. It's interesting, if you zoom way in, you can actually see four prominences. With my binoculars, I could barely make out the one, but that's why I love capturing things on camera. I can see the little details that I missed in the moment. And it's also crazy, right as the edge of the sun started peeking through, and you can see this diamond ring effect, those prominences revealed their true scale for just a fleeting moment before disappearing in the bright sunlight. And something else interesting in these images of the diamond ring, when the sun starts shining through again, see all those blurry blobs? I thought there was just some dust on the lens until I started recording again. Those are actually tons of insects that were flying overhead. 
Dr. Telepin said to observe the animals. We were caught up in the moment, but I do remember having to swat away a few more bugs during totality, bugs that might have been hiding in the grass earlier in that afternoon heat. And then here's me trying to get the sun back in frame after I put the solar filter back on. It's just the most beautiful thing to see that tiny sliver appear again after totality. It's definitely a spiritual experience. I mean, it's crazy how we can use math and science to predict the orbits of everything down to the millisecond, but there's no way this video could come close to what we felt out there in the field. You could hear people cheering. It's funny, back in 2017, we were in our backyard and there were only a few people around. Nobody really cheered, but we all had that same strange joy when we looked up and saw the cool blue tinged rays extending out from the sun. While many were packing up, I hung around and took a series of pictures until fourth contact when the eclipse was over. And after that, I put all my photos together into this composite, which will soon be joining my other picture on the wall behind me. This photo doesn't do justice to the experience we had. Nothing can. You truly have to be there, which is why there are so many people who travel around the world for every eclipse, like the next one in Spain in 2026. But the photo is pretty cool. If you want to grab it for personal use, I put it up on redshirtjeff.com too, but I won't tell anyone if you go on my Flickr and grab a copy just for your own personal use. Now you might notice I was wearing a dark mode shirt during the eclipse. That was a shirt from Techno Tim's merch store. He's another tech creator, and I'm not going to lie, I was jealous at how comfortable that shirt is. I've run redshirtjeff.com for my merch for a few years, but it's been kind of painful. I'm rebuilding my merch store this year to make it easier for you to buy classics like It Was DNS and cosplaying as a sysadmin, but I'm trying something new. I created a Squarespace site, and in less than an hour, I already had a few products set up. It took me less than a day to get the whole thing running, but it's not quite ready for launch, but not because of Squarespace. I'm also partnering with someone new for better quality prints. Now, you might ask why I'm not self-hosting this time. That's because for this site, Squarespace means I don't have to take care of maintenance, run and patch my own servers, or deal with integrations like finicky payment gateways. Squarespace does that stuff. And I know things like SEO best practices and how to build out a website since that used to be my day job, but if you don't, Squarespace has tools to guide you. Like their Blueprint AI and integrated SEO tools can get your site polished quickly. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash redshirtjeff to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.